Now, he was only a young man, and he was uh, 19, 20 when he started to have a real reputation. But at the age of 20, he suddenly discovered something that really changed his life. And this was the sujigahana, the technique I mentioned earlier, this ancient technique that was used to decorate textiles. It, too, was a, a resist uh, kind of dyeing technique, but it used tying rather than paste. So it was much more intense, again, very labor intensive. And once the dyeing had been done, the Tsujigahana textiles would be touched up with ink drawings, sometimes with gold leaf, sometimes with embroidery. And the examples that I'm showing you here, there aren't a lot of uh, full kimono done with Tsujigahana that are still in existence. And what you see on here is a screen where you have pieces of two kimono that were, the cloth was taken and mounted on a screen because they were so rare, they wanted to be preserved. And you have a wonderful example of Tsujigahana here and a detail over there where you can see that the White areas were uh, stitched around, pulled tight, and then protected during the dye. And when the dyeing was done, then they were taken and flattened out, and you would have ink drawing done on them to, to make the whole thing a little bit more elegant. So Kubota saw a design like this, a piece of textile, only a fragment of textile in a museum, and became entranced with it. It really captivated his imagination, and at 20 years old, he said, this will be my life's work. This is something I want to learn how to recreate. <laughs> now keep in mind, this technique disappeared at the end of the, uh, the, the uh, 17th century, so around 1699 or thereabouts, and Nobody in the modern day textile trade knew how to do any of these techniques. You did know re pace, uh, tie resist, but they could not really duplicate the kind of uh, work that was done on these textiles. So Kubota had a really lot of work laid out for him. One of the things he realized very soon, though, in his uh, research and his experimentation was that he was not going to be able to reproduce Tsujigahana exactly as it had been in the early years. The types of fabric we had today uh, in his day were different. The types of dye used were different. So what he decided ultimately was that it would be necessary to recreate it in a style that fit the modern world. And this is where he really put his skills as a Yuzen dyer uh, to good effect, because he used Yuzen dyeing, a combination of Yuzen dyeing, tie dyeing, which uh, the form he used is known as shibori in Japan, and uh, it's a very intense, tightly, tightly tied kind of uh, uh, dyeing technique where um, you, you have to make hundreds, if not thousands, of little ties to get the right effect. Uh, he also had studied Western art as well as Japanese art, and so he took all of these things, the combination of modern dyes, his experience in Yuzen, his understanding of Japanese and Western art, of uh, new types of fabric that could be used, and just put this all together to create his version of Tsujigahana, which he called Ichiku Tsujigahana, because he wanted a reference to this textile that had so inspired him, something similar to the one on my left, and then what he came up with on his own, a piece of Ichiku Tsujigahana, where you can really see that he's used the elements, but that it goes beyond what uh, the original one was. He did several decades of research, and he was a perfectionist, too. And it wasn't until 
oh, of the uh, 1970s, the early to mid-1970s, that he felt he had enough control of the Tsujigahana to really start exhibiting it. And this is one of his early pieces. Uh, it's from 1980, and in a minute I'll show you another early piece that's a little bit earlier than this. Uh, but this gives you an idea of where he was coming from. It's a very traditional design in some ways. The weeping cherry tree, that's uh, a constant motif in uh, Japanese art and in Japanese textiles. And so looking at this, at first you might think, well, it's a traditional type kimono. But then you look at the kind of dyeing techniques he used, the ink work that's on it, and it becomes a very different thing. But this was one of the first pieces uh, he showed uh, in the 1980s. And uh, let me just go on to the next one, which was uh, in his first exhibition in uh, the 1977 exhibition. Uh, I think that was at uh, Mikimoto in Tokyo, if I uh, remember correctly. So this was one of his very early pieces, too. And a kimono that looks like a regular kimono in some ways, but the design is just very, very different. In the earlier pieces, he does tend to look more traditional. He tends to use traditional kinds of elements, um, this cloud-like form you see in a lot of uh, older kimono, this uh, lozenge, uh, this sort of almost zigzag form, that appears in many, many traditional designs. But then when you start looking at the detail and the kind of dyeing, that's where the differences really come up. And in these early kimono, he did stick mostly to dyeing. He was uh, careful with the kind of ink drawing he do. He did, but it did start to change over time. And when we see the later kimono, you will see that they are very, very intensely drawn as well as intensely dyed. <laughs> 